It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcasting and interviewing Lori Rowland, RDHMS, who is a dental hygienist and educator with 20 years of experience. She earned her Bachelor of Science degree in Interdisciplinary Studies and her Master's of Science degree in Curriculum Instruction from Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas, which is less than an hour from four of my five grandchildren. In 1999, she received her dental hygiene license after graduating from the Blinn College Dental Hygiene Program in Bryan, Texas. She is now a professor at Blinn College, serving as clinical coordinator and teaching preclinical hygiene, uh, hygiene, dental hygiene care and dental hygiene practice. And I'll tell you what, I loved your article this month in Dental Town Magazine. Um, you really hit the nail on the head. It says no answers. How hygienists should respond when asked to overlook or ignore clinical violations. Um, I wanted to get you on the show. The minute, first of all, thank you so much for writing that article. Uh, it was amazing. And I have heard, you know, I've met so many hygienists over the last 31 years, and so many of them say, you know, the doctor will say, we need to redo this crown on number 19 because that's open margin. And she's sitting there thinking, well, dude, you put two crowns in her mouth and they both have bigger open margins than this one. And he's like, well, I did those. I know there's everything's good underneath there. And, uh, so um, so talk about that that article. What what made you write that and why did it hit such a nail on the head? Well, I had 10 years of experience prior to uh, coming on full time in the education world. And even though I personally didn't experience a lot of um, issues being asked to do things like that, uh, the more that I experienced having students go out into the real world and contact me afterward, I realized that it was almost more the norm, you know, than uh, one would think to be put in some degree of situation like that where they felt like they were being a little bit pressured to not follow uh, what they were taught. And do you, do you see this? I mean, you've been doing this for two decades. Um, do you see this is a, a bigger problem today than it was 20 years ago? Or would you say it's always been that way? I think it's always been this way, but I think that um, we're becoming a little bit more empowered to say something about it and also realizing how important it is to, you know, uphold our license and uh, make sure that we're doing the best for our patients and, you know, as ethical decision makers and dental professionals to, you know, do what's right for the, the patient. Although I think with more offices, you know, in competition with each other, with the prevalence of dental offices I know in our town, um, there is kind of some pressure out there to increase, you know, profitability. And I think sometimes, you know, that creates a little bit more of a pressure to then break the rules um, out of an effort to maximize profits. Well, when you say maximize profit, do you think it's a bigger problem with DSOs or do you think the DSOs are just uh, more in the limelight and it's just as prevalent in private practice as it is in um, big DSOs? I think absolutely it's equivalent across the board, uh, whether it's a private practice or more of a corporate um, setting, um, just because they both have different uh, motivations and kind of rules under which they uh, practice. So I, I think it's, you know, equally prevalent in my experience. So what, what advice would you give to a hygienist listening to you right now or a dentist? Um, you know, I, I've seen so much dysfunction in dental offices where a hygienist will ask a question about an x-ray and a dentist will say something like, well, that's why I went to dental school. And then that, and that, that's the answer. I'm like, holy moly, man, if you can't explain this to your hygienist with four years of college who's been working with you, then how, what does that say about your treatment plan presentation? I mean, I mean, I, I think having everybody with wet hands and even up front with the dry hands on deck, everybody has to understand the clinical diagnosis and treatment plan and protocol. 
Absolutely. Well, my advice to hygienists would be to absolutely, first of all, be familiar with all of the you know, rules and regulations uh, in, under which they practice. And it's overwhelming. It's a, you know, large volume of material to go through and it's, you know, pretty dry and uh, difficult to muddle through. But the importance is, you know, can't be overstated uh, to be familiar with what your dentist obligations are, the assistants, the hygienists. Um, dental labs, everybody involved in the entire process. And, you know, if you're not familiar with those, you don't know, you know, if you are being asked to do something that's um, illegal or unethical. And uh, so, first of all, to be familiar with those. And, you know, even if you don't have everything memorized, at least being familiar, you can say, I know that was referenced in my you know, rules and regulations and can easily go back and find that. And to the first time you're asked to do something that you know is illegal to, you know, make sure that you don't do that and have a visit with the, the dentist or whomever is asking you to do something that is out of your scope of practice and express to them your concern and you know if they're not familiar with that uh, law to bring it to their attention and you know set the precedence right then and there the first time that happens because you know just like in any other scenario the first time you agree to do something that goes against you know what you're supposed to be doing um, legally you're just going to be asked to do that over and over and then one thing leads to another so you know, you've just got to be really prepared to go out there. And I, I don't like to give my students a, a negative impression of the dental field, but because I know how often it occurs, I do want them to think about that and be prepared if they are put into that position because it's very difficult for um, anyone to stand up for their employer, I think, and a lot of times it's, you know, younger um, females and, you know, they might, uh, their family might be kind of relying on their income or, um, you know, they might really need that position and feel very uh, awkward about bringing that to the dentist's attention, but they just have to do it and they just don't want to end up working in an office uh, for anyone that is going to ask them to jeopardize their license. Well, can you give some examples? Cause there might be some dentists listening to you right now that say, Oh, I would never do that. And they don't even realize they're doing it. What, what, what ex concrete examples are that would you Absolutely. share? Well, um, one thing that's a, a very <clears throat> common problem, at least here in Texas, is there are very strict rules about uh, the monitoring of nitrous oxide. And um, Dennis, you know, one, one concrete example that happened recently that I heard about from a former student was uh, the dentist wanted them to initiate the nitrous oxide on her patient. And there's, it's cut and dry. That's absolutely not permissible in Texas to initiate that nitrous oxide. And the, the former student refused to do that. And so the dentist sent his assistant in to start it, which is just as illegal uh, for the assistant to initiate it. So our former student told the assistant, you know, it's also illegal for you to do this, but you know, that's just one example. Another dentist wasn't uh, wanting lead aprons to be used on their patients just because of the time and inconvenience and the cost of, you know, having those uh, lead aprons for every patient. So um, that's another example. Um, you know, not taking vital signs on a patient unless there's something wrong, which it's kind of hard to know if there's something wrong if you don't take their vitals. I think that's an important service that we provide for our patients is uh, an important uh, part of what we do. So, you know, those are just a few of the examples that I'm called about on a routine basis or, you know, being asked to see a patient that hasn't had a dental exam within a year. That's very common. 
Um, and absolutely, you know, no, cut and dry that that's not permissible. So, um, you know, there are a lot of things like that that either the dentist is not thinking about or the front desk, you know, may not be aware of that and scheduling patients that don't fall into that category. So it's just making sure that you know about the the laws and making sure that you don't do anything to compromise that. And then, you know, uh, visiting with those people asking you to do that and explaining why that is not going to occur with you. Now, <clears throat> the one thing that's so confusing to the young, when, if you're still in dental kindergarten or hygiene kindergarten school, and you haven't got out yet, you're you're on social media, you're on Dental Town or Hygiene Town or Facebook, and you hear about how dentists are doing that, and you think, um, oh, well, we live in one country, but we don't really live in one country. We live in 50 different states, and the devil's in the details, and these states are, are different from state to state. So when your Facebook friend is telling you that she does this, and she's in Louisiana, and you're in Texas, and the other girl chiming in from New York, you're, you might as well, you could be living in three different countries. Would you say, uh, would you agree with that or not really? Absolutely. That's why it's so imperative to be informed with your own state's, you know, Dental Practice Act and rules and regulations because it does vary from state to state. And so, you know, Texas is one of those states that is a little bit uh, less progressive in uh, the duties that a dental hygienist is allowed to perform. But, um, you know, not that that's right or wrong, but, um, you know, whether we agree with it or not, or think, gosh, I, you know, I feel very comfortable initiating not the nitrous oxide. I feel like that's something that, you know, I would be capable of doing. It's, it's against the law. So whether I agree with it or disagree with it or think, you know, you know, I've seen so many patients on nitrous and it doesn't seem to, you know, ever be you know, an issue that makes me concerned about doing, you know, initiating the mattress, that is something that in Texas is absolutely illegal. So um, they just have to kind of stand up for themselves and, and refuse to do something that they uh, know is against the rules and regulations. But it does vary drastically by state and you just have to, you know, again, be aware of the rules under which you practice and make sure that you're following those and aware of them. So um, besides nitro, now, besides nitrous oxide, what, what's another example? Well, you know, like I said, taking bottles on every patient, um, using lead aprons, uh, infection control procedures, um, you know, doing, doing what others in your a profession with your license would consider standard of care. Um, also, the you know those are really common ones that we hear. Um, a lot of uh, former students feel very pressured to churn out as many patients as they can per hour, and a lot of times that's by skipping proper assessments, perio charting intraoral exam, extraoral exam, um, documentation kind of falls by the wayside when you're, you know, trying to see a patient every 20 minutes. So the standard of care really uh, suffers when that time limit is imposed on hygienists or certain tasks are delegated to other members of the team where it can be lost, you know, what exactly has been done for this patient? Have we followed the right protocol throughout? Because, you know, you might assume that the assistant took the vital signs for the patient before you saw them. And, you know, that could absolutely not be the case uh, because of rushing between, you know, from one patient to the next daily. Um, the, the other thing you were talking about, um, vital signs. I mean, you know, you go to any doctor, physician, the, anywhere. The first thing they do is take vitals. They at least, um, take temperature, weight, um, height, um, you know, anesthetic. Uh, I lived in Arizona 
been practicing out here since 87. We've had a, uh, an, a just a lidocaine death of a child. And wow. of course, they didn't even weigh the child. Um, um, I mean, can, have you been to a physician in the last 10 years that when you walked in there didn't start with temperature, blood pressure, weight? Absolutely not. I think um, every doctor visit that I've gone to in 20 years, they have you stand on a scale, they um, they take your weight, they, they take your blood pressure, pulse, uh, all in that. I mean, it's just, it's standard operating procedure and you don't think it's anything that big a deal, but when you have a four-year-old child uh, die, uh, because and, and and you can't say how many carpules of anesthetic you gave them and how much how much did the patient weigh and and you know what was the maximum dose and when you have these one liners well well you can give this many to any human I mean what what's the variance of weight in Texas I mean you you could have you could have a ninety pound little girl all the way to a four hundred pound cowboy absolutely i you know documentation again is you know just vital and just making sure that we you know look at what's truly important and that's to take good care of the patient and we end up seeing a lot of patients here at our school and in private practice that may not go to see a general practitioner they have never had any kind of outward symptoms or signs of, of things like you know, having elevated blood pressure and, you know, we're kind of a, a great uh, resource for those patients that, you know, maybe have always felt like routine dental care or emergency dental care was something that they were more prone to um, pursue and maybe haven't been to a, a regular physician for anything uh, in the recent past. And we can really a huge service for those patients by informing them if they have um, readings that are out of the out of the ordinary. We had a child in our clinic years ago that whose blood pressure was you know very very high for a child her age, and it turned out that was the first indication that she was having extreme kidney failure. And had to be actually, after she went to the physician, had to be um, airlifted to a children's hospital out of town. And that was the only, you know, the only indication was from our student taking that child's blood pressure. So it, you know, she would have exhibited signs eventually, but it was such a blessing that uh, it was caught so quickly uh, because of the student taking those vital signs and paying attention a lot of people do it so um so unattentively that they kind of just you know listen half-heartedly and don't uh really take the time if they're doing it manually to make sure that their reading is accurate or take it twice um so that's one example where bottles could have potentially saved a child's life and you never know when that opportunity is going to present itself so where if someone's listening to you right now how how can they find their state laws where would they go what what did you say the um dental board they would go to the texas state board of dental examiners website the tsbde um and there's agency publications the rules and regulations are published, and then a separate document is the Dental Practice Act that's in the Occupations Code for the state of Texas. Um, yeah. So two documents that they publish, that the state board publishes, the rules and regulations and the Dental Practice Act, which is under the Occupations Code. Huh. Um. Yeah, and I, I want to go to infection control because back in the day, um, a lot of doctors might be wondering, oh, this the local hospital in uh, this town saw five or six patients and three of them ate at this uh, restaurant or two of them went to this dental office and it was they just had gut feelings. But now it's literally the technology. It's a crime scene. The CDC can, can come back to you and I've seen this. And I've seen some, uh, there was one example of a really good old boy in Oklahoma who was just a great guy, 
but had no idea the staff weren't following the, the, the protocol and wasn't on top of it. And sure enough, a bunch of people got a virus and they trace it all back to that office and, and it's in social media, it's on the newspaper. I mean, when you have the local Centers for Disease Control telling that all of his patients need to be tested, that is not a practice builder. And, um, and then the liability of it. I mean, if I was going to you to get my teeth clean and then it turns out that you did not know that your autoclave quit working a year ago and you don't spore test and now I have liver failure and I find out you have a big house and a car and a boat, guess what's going to happen? Bye-bye. Yeah. It should be that way. You know, I, we should be held accountable for um, what we do in our practice and people come and trust us and and want to feel assured that we're following all of the things that we should know that we need to follow. So, you know, we live in a much more informed society now. And, you know, it's great that people get on the internet and, and ask questions and they talk to you about it. And any time a story comes out, like what happened in Oklahoma or a child, you know, dying from an overdose of anesthetic, um, you know, good for them for coming in and being their own advocate and asking questions. And, you know, if the dental team doesn't have good answers, then maybe they should, you know, look, look elsewhere. Yeah, um, I, I want to talk about co-diagnosis because I've, I've always believed, and you know, at the end of the day, we're humans and we have a lot of animal behaviors. And um, when you go in there, and start talking, you know, you need an MO and an MOD and a PFM. You start talking Latin and Greek, the patient doesn't even understand. But the, but the hygienist is in there for an hour. And I always told them, you know, I wanted, my hygienist, were, we've always been on the same page. And um, she will see a cavity uh, on the dis, distal of the tooth. She'll show them, she'll say it's a flossing cavity, not an MO or a DO to link it to a behavior they're doing or not doing. And whenever I disagree, I have always called, if she says it's a cavity and I say it's a watch, well, I don't, I, I don't sit there and say, well, I'm the doctor and you're the hygienist. I have always for 31 years call in a third party, either call in an, another of the dentists or another associates and they come in the room and I say, hey, I'm not telling you how we voted, but what do you, what do, what do you see on 30? And, and if they were ever disagree with me, uh, like say they said it was a watch and I said it was a do. Then when I was seeing that patient to do the filling, as soon as I broke through the marginal ridge and was getting ready to take out uh, stuff, I, I, I would stop and call in the hygienist for that feedback. Now, granted, you know, right. my, my new hygienist uh, is uh, been there nine years. So, I mean, we don't have to do these lessons anymore, but it's just so important. It, it, if you, if I, it, when I look at dentist treatment plan presentation, I mean, most of them don't even have a 20% close rate and the, the people who have a 20% close rate, they can't even convince their hygienist. And when you can get the hygienist, the assistants of the dentist to all be on the same page, well, your treatment plan presentation is going to skyrocket. And I mean, at the end of the day, I got five grandkids and four of them are in Beeville. How, how far are you away from Beeville? I couldn't tell you. I, I really never don't heard know. of Beeville? I've, I've heard of it, but Texas is a, is a yeah, large state. It's by so Refugio. It's about, a, it's, about a, it's, about a, it's about an hour and a half south of San Antonio and about 30 miles east, west of Refugio, Texas. That Beeville is. Yeah. Okay. But, 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 you know, my, yeah. my goal in office is I would want, if my grandchildren went to your office, I would want you to be able to attract them, retain them, educate them, self mastery, motivate them to brush and floss. And if they did have four cavities, to me, it's not acceptable that, that you just aren't good and have a 20% close rate. I mean, if you had a 20% close rate, and your sister had a 50% close rate, I'd want my grandkids to go to the one that had a close rate because who? I don't want my kids, my grandkids to be diagnosed with a cavity. I want them to get fixed and repaired. Yeah. And then I want them to gain self mastery of how they can prevent this in the future. And you just can't do that when you, um, when the, when the dentist and the hygienist and the assistant are on the same page. Exactly. And I think, you know, a lot of time when I'm when I'm talking to my students about so many of the issues that we see um, in dentistry, 
these days, it so many things boil down to time. And, you know, it takes time to communicate with a patient. It takes time for everybody to be on the same page. It takes time to do all the assessments and things that we need to to make sure that we're, you know, presenting the best plan for the patient. And I just, I don't know what the solution is except to say that, you know, if you aren't given enough time to perform the tasks and services that you're supposed to be performing with each patient, then something needs to be done about that because, you know, that's just, I think, one of the the biggest factors. And I think dentists need to realize that if the hygienists are given more time to build that relationship and the rapport and the trust that needs to be established between a patient and their, you know, healthcare providers, that, you know, the case acceptance would you know, go way up. But when people feel like they're coming in, you know, to a cattle call and just kind of one after the next and, you know, just told you need to do this, this, and this, the the level of trust isn't there. And that's very understandable. So I, I think that a lot of the issues that we're facing, you know, in every aspect boil down to the dentist whoever owns the practice not wanting the time to be spent on it when I think it would be a good return on your investment to spend that time but I think it's just not perceived that way so the um the only thing um when, when you talk about lead aprons I'm gonna switch to lead aprons because some some things that concern me is like a new technology will come out like a CBCT and then, and then some dentists, you know, they just have one protocol for every new patient. They immediately buy a CBCT and then they just say, yeah, we're going to take one on every new patient uh, to screen them for ortho or then I'm like, whoa, whoa, horsey, slow down. How much radiation is that? And some of these guys, um, they might have a lead apron, but it doesn't have a thyroid collar. And, you know, I've podcasted some um, oral radiologists that are extremely I'm concerned about some of these new CBCT x-ray machines. They're extremely concerned about um, lack of a thyroid collar. So talk lead aprons. So why, why, um, what, what are your thoughts on lead aprons and in these new higher dose machines such as CBCT? Well, I, I personally don't care how much radiation is, uh, you know, the patient is exposed to in regards of, you know, whether it's a, a minute amount with digital radiographs or if it's, you know, higher levels with a panoramic x-ray or whatever the case may be. Um, the law says that you need, in Texas, a lead apron with a thyroid collar. So, you know, whether or not they're getting exposed the same amount as, you know, being on an airplane traveling from Texas to California, I don't care. I, you know, it's cumulative and, you know, whether whether that one exposure is going to, you know, create any type of problem with that person, you know, no, it's not. But one, it's the law. And number two, there's no reason not to do it. I just, I, I don't understand what the, the the point would be to not do it other than it does take some time. They are, um, you know, an expense for the office. Um, I, I think that maybe some of the reps when they talk to the dentist are maybe touting you know, the low radiation exposure of, you know, their equipment or whatever the case may be, and maybe mention something like, gosh, you wouldn't even need to use it. Yeah, I, I don't know what the cause for this is that that wouldn't be something that would be just such a standard routine, not an issue, but it is in, in practices that I've, you know, heard of firsthand. Um, and then, you know, one hygienist will, a, a mom will bring in two siblings and one hygienist will feel very strongly about it, utilize the lead apron for radiographs. And the other hygienist has maybe decided that, you know, the dentist saying that they don't really need to is good enough and doesn't 
you know, put one on the other sibling and the mom wants to know, well, why did this, you know, why did my, you know, son have a lead apron and my daughter that was being treated, you know, in the same office not have a lead apron with the same x-ray? So, you know, I just, a lot of these things, I don't see any reason why they wouldn't be followed except, you know, time and money are the things that unfortunately dictate a lot of, you know, what, what's being done. But again, that's a cut and dry, you know, a cut and dry law uh, that we need to follow. And again, whether it's minimal or whether it's a larger, you know, exposure, it doesn't matter. It's, you know, a, a lead apron with a thyroid collar. So in Texas, I do know that um, if you are going to give anybody an injection over the age of 13, you have to get to uh, have their blood pressure. My, my question being an owner of a dental office, um, who legally can take vitals like in Texas? I mean, I'm not expecting you to know Arizona law, but I mean, can does that have to be the dentist, the hygienist, can the assistant? Uh, anyone in the the assistant, hygienist, or the dentist can take the vital signs, take and record. Yes. And what about um? <clears throat> there's a threat on Dental Town about which vitals do you require to take at every appointment, and a lot of people say they just ask the weight, but I'm sitting there thinking ask the weight i mean um do you, i mean i i can't see that standing up in court well she told me she was 145 well she was 185 uh, I, I mean do you, do you think right. asking the weight is acceptable on vials or do you think they should stand on a scale well i think for any procedure that that would be you know a, a great importance with anesthesia that it should be documented and verified a lot of people don't know how much they weigh and uh you know i think that's an important enough issue that you know if there is a procedure where you know they are going to be under anesthesia that that's something that uh, definitely needs to be reported and not it's just like asking somebody how does your blood pressure normally run well they're going to tell you either they don't know or just take a guess or it's you know even when you take uh people's blood pressure and it's elevated, a lot of times they want to make an excuse for that. Oh, I was, you know, in a hurry or I'm, I'm nervous. And absolutely, some of those things do affect blood pressure, of course, but, you know, when it's, you know, 190 over 110, that's, uh, that's an issue that needs to be addressed or every time they come in, you know, it's elevated and they have kind of an excuse for every time. Well, you know, that's kind of a, a pattern that we're seeing. So um, I think that any time that vitals are taken, it's important that they be accurate. So that's why we take blood pressure, you know, multiple times if there seems to be any kind of issue with getting, you know, if something seems out of the norm or um, if, if, you know, anything uh, occurs that would make you think that that might not be as accurate as it could be. Are you seeing any um, enforcement? I mean, are there dentists that you've seen in Texas that weren't doing these things and got uh, in trouble for it? Yes. Um, I think that most of the time, um, fortunately, there aren't a lot of times when the the negligence on not taking some of these vital statistics it you know everything turns out okay and you know that's good and that's bad it kind of makes people relax a little bit on the importance but you know when there is a negative outcome usually it's pretty bad and uh if it's something that gets brought to the attention of the state board and yes you know there are reprimands and you know loss of licensure and and things that have to be done to either reinstate your license or keep it so um you know unfortunately i think that it's so prevalent and you know like i said there's not going to be an adverse outcome every time somebody comes in that is you know uh, in jeopardy for for a negative outcome so you know, it just kind of depends if something really bad happens. Um, 
And so it kind of gets uh, put by the wayside, just like with infection control. You know, you do these practices over and over and things get, you know, very lax on infection control. And, you know, that could occur for years and years without anything being documented um, as happening because of that. And so, you know, uh, it's just unfortunate that some of these things get put to the side because there aren't more negative outcomes to force them into a different action. Does the Dental Practice Act go into much detail about infection control? Not much detail. They um, definitely have uh, protocols, but that's more something that is specified, you know, through continuing education and through school and kind of left to what someone in your similar circumstance would consider the standard of care. So a lot of times it's a little bit vague like that, but um, as far as like routine, you know, modern monitoring, score testing, like you said, of the autoclaves, you know, uh, how you treat critical, semi-critical um, equipment in the dental office. So all of that is, you know, outlined, but as far as getting, you know, really specific, um, you know, it, it would take up quite a bit of, uh, room in that document, but uh, pretty much broad, broad delineations of what uh, practices should be uh, put in place for each type of uh, equipment. Do you see actual laws talking about the lead apron and a thyroid collar? Yes. Absolutely. In Texas, yes. It's under the um, dental radiography lab that might uh, call it and there's about three or four different uh, regulations under that and you know one of them is that on every exposure every patient that a lead apron with a thyroid collar is to be utilized I, in I'm, fact I'm familiar enough with that one because uh that's often one that we kind of cut and paste and send out for information for people that are being asked to, you know, not follow that standard of care. Uh, another one I see abused a lot is, you know, is the, is the patient the tail wagging the doctor, the dental office, the dog or vice versa, but they call on the phone and they just want an appointment to get their teeth cleaned. And they see an opening and they schedule a new patient in there and the hygienist seats the patients, takes x-rays, starts doing the cleaning, doing the whole nine yards. And many states, that's illegal. The dentist would have to diagnose you first and diagnose that you need a cleaning, not to mention in my office, we have five different cleanings. So uh, talk about right. that. Well, again, you know, it's on something like that where someone is scheduled um, to kind of meet the convenience of, you know, that patient, the, the dentist might be scheduled to, you know, be out of town Wednesday afternoon, but this patient really wants to get in. The hygiene, you know, schedule has, you know, one or two openings, so let's get that patient in and you know, have the hygienist do whatever needs to be done. And, you know, yes, as a dental hygienist, especially with some experience, um, you pretty much uh, have a good idea of what a proper protocol for that patient would be. But once again, you know, that's absolutely illegal. And, um, you know, in our our office, we had a, a really great protocol where when we had a new patient in, of course, we had to make sure, first of all, that the dentist was going to be in the office at that time. But uh, the patient would see the, the hygienist first, and there were pretty much standing orders on, you know, protocol for minimum um, radiographs, assessments that needed to be uh, performed on that patient to get a, a clear picture of their, you know, periodontal um, health. And then we would go, the hygienist would go and visit with the, the dentist and kind of give an overview of that patient after we had spent probably an hour with the patient. And then the dentist would come on in and do the initial exam. 
and then we get on in the second hour we get started on whatever cleaning was was diagnosed and so you know oftentimes that wouldn't be you know a routine prophylaxis that could be accomplished in that one time but at least we get you know patients do want you to get started if they come in for a cleaning you know, it does make them feel good to go ahead and at least get started um, on that procedure. So, again, with some time and some, you know, explanation to the patient as to why it's going to be multiple appointments, the acceptance is really great. But that was that was the way that we kind of figured out that it was best for our office, best for the patient, best for the dentist, because... You know, they weren't trying to make uh, snap decisions before all the assessments and radiographs. And then, you know, if additional radiographs were needed, then they could uh, diagnose those and prescribe them at the same time uh, and come back in with the patient after whatever procedure was that we were. So we worked it out to have a really good system that I think took great care of the patient and also protected you know, everybody's licensed by following a standard of care and really taking good care of the patient. You know, you, you don't want to be a commodity. You want to have a unique selling proposition. You want your patients to think that, not that all dentists are the same. They don't think all restaurants are the same. They don't think all cards are the same, but you know what? They come into your dental office and you take their vitals. A lot of people are interested in their vitals because it's all about them. You don't have to be very narcissistic to be curious about what your blood pressure is. I mean, I don't really care about the blood pressure of the guy across the street from me, but I think patients really like that information and then they, they put you more in the category that you're a doctor and they're not. You're taking their vitals, you're doing this, and then when you tell them they have an infection or a cavity or whatever, it's more believable. I wanna I want ask you about your hygiene school. Um, you've been uh, an instructor at Bling College hygiene program is that still a mostly male thing? I mean, a female thing? Or are you seeing an increase in males joining the dental hygiene over your last couple decades? There really has not been, for our program, much of a change. We've had in the history of our program, I want to say four or five uh, male students come through we accept 14 students we used to only accept 12 students a year but for the past you know number of years we've accepted 14 students into our program every year ours is a two-year associate's degree program and we just do not see many males entering the profession um and i don't you know i can't say for sure why that is I think that if I were a male I guess I probably maybe would feel a little bit uncomfortable going into a you know predominantly female profession um, just out of my own I guess self uh, insecurities maybe but I you know think that that would be a great um, you know a great asset to the profession to have more males and we've had male students that have gone out and worked for male dentists female dentists so i you know i don't think there should be any reason why it would attract one um sex over the other but you know i do perceive dental hygiene as kind of a nurturing part of it a little bit um i think if you're doing it right you're taking care of that patient you're spending time with them you're connecting with the patient and maybe males you know in general don't find that aspect of it as appealing i you know i don't know i don't know what the answer is but well they don't know, like to talk about the difference between boys and girls or your sexes but there's just clearly a difference between boys and girls i mean 99 percent of minors are men and most of the hygienists you go in a hospital it's mostly women I mean there, there are biological differences between men and women but did I uh, did you know my uncle Mike was the first male nurse in uh, Parsons Kansas you know why he went into nursing to make girls well, and Shirley uh, never went out with him in high school. And then when high school was over, he was so sad he was never going to see uh, Shirley again. And then he found out she signed up to nursing school. So he signed up the next day. And and by senior year, I have to uh, congratulate my Uncle Mike. He married Shirley uh, before she got a registered nurse degree. And uh, my gosh, um, 
why you so if you know any uh, if your son is single and he can't get a date i mean my god why wouldn't you send him to hygiene school or nursing school to be the only boy in the class i mean that's when the competition with girls gets good is when you're the only boy um, Absolutely. And I also have I to say, I think there should be, I mean, I hate to ever lobby for a state law, but <clears throat> I, I think it's a crime that uh, all the nurses, uh, so many of the nurses are females because in Arizona, in these nursing homes, um, when uh, the when the big man falls in the shower, the, the two little nurses, right. on they, they can't get him back to bed, so they're always calling the fire department. I have patients that work for the fire department and say, you know, why in Arizona, I know this sounds politically incorrect, but most of the nurses in Arizona are Latino or Filipino. That's just, it just is what it is. I'm not saying right or wrong. They're, they're not boys. They're not a bunch of uh, Russian men. They're, they're, and these two little girls can't get a 200 pound grandpa back in, in bed. So that they're forced to call the fire department. The fire department's, uh, my friends in the fire department told me, it says every, Every hospital and every nursing home should have at least one man in there that could pick your butt up and get you back in bed. I mean, it just it just seems uh, uh, crazy like that. I, I want to talk about supply and demand of hygiene. Um, when your 14 students graduate, how easy is it to get employment? And has that changed any in the last 10 or 20 years? I think that... It has always been, you know, I, we are blessed to have a smaller program. So, um, and our twin cities are fairly small. What are your small twin cities? Brian College Station. So College Station has Texas A&M University. So it's kind of, you know, they're, they're both um, large student cities, but College Station definitely has a lot of variety in our population, depending on uh, if school is in session or not, but um, we are definitely not, you know, a Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, but we attract students from all over uh, our area, and oftentimes they go back um, to their homes, and just because it, especially being a two-year program, you know, they think, okay, I can commute for two years or I can move here temporarily for two years and then go back uh, to their, what they consider home. And so we're close to Austin, Houston, Dallas, um, a good central location. So our students typically do not have any problems whatsoever finding employment. And that's been the case, you know, for, for as you know, long as our program has been in existence. Um, I think that now with, you know, so many, I know speaking for our towns, we used to know every single dentist in town. It was all part of practice. You know, you had those established dentists that, you know, everybody knew who they were and we simply used word of mouth for, oh, do you need a hygienist? Oh, I know this person that's, you know, everything's word of mouth have a small town feel um now it feels like there's a, a dental office on every street corner and you know we aren't as familiar with the dentist oftentimes and you know there's so many more practices and i don't think you know sometimes we can't keep up with um you know there are too many dental offices uh right now in my opinion you know, that they're having to find ways to compete for patients. And, you know, unfortunately, sometimes I think care is, um, you know, not really improved when that kind of situation occurs. Um, but our students really have found it very easy to go out into different cities and find employment. And, you know, fortunately, our school has a, a great reputation and often students that are out in in practices that need another hygienist, they will be asked, you know, do you know of any other blend graduates that are available to come in because they were happy with, you know, the hygienist that they employed. So two, two we've more, got a great- Two more legal things. Do you, um, what's the status of dental therapist in um, Texas? Is that dead on arrival or do you think that's gonna happen? Right now, for sure. It, we're, like I said, we're, 
pretty much behind um, a lot of other states as far as uh, our scope of practice for dental hygiene. Um, we're one of a few states where hygienists aren't uh, permitted to deliver local anesthesia. And so, they so can I can't. Cannot. See, I think that's unfair because your program's two years. They have to have two years of undergraduate requirements first. So it's really a four year program? They do have uh, quite a few prerequisites that have to be uh, met prior to being accepted into the program. It doesn't really equate to two years of you know, college experience. A lot of our students, though, you know, and it doesn't matter in Texas, uh, graduates with a, an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree have, you know, equal uh, responsibilities. And, I mean, could you, uh, could you take kids right out of high school? Well, it, that just wouldn't be possible just because they wouldn't have had all the prerequisites that but they how, would need how to many, have. How long does it take the average hygiene student in your college to get the requirements done? Usually, uh, usually about a year. Um, with One Texas year? A&M, about a year. Um, with A&M um, in our backyard, uh, we have a lot of students that come to our program with bachelor's degrees, master's degrees. So, you know, that's not uncommon for our specific program. When I came to hygiene school here, um, I already had my master's degree. So I looked at it as an opportunity to kind of, you know, uh, go into a different career and uh, go into the healthcare field. And so I, you know, had my master's degree coming in. So. Uh, we're a little bit, you know, in a unique position in that regard uh, with our proximity to, to Texas a and So a lot of students get, you know, a, a general health degree at A&M and then want to uh, kind of focus that and go into a specific field and then they come into dental hygiene. And so you think um, independent practice and dental therapists is just not going to happen in Texas? Not in Texas for quite some time. And again, it, it absolutely, you know, I see these students come through and, you know, they're highly intelligent, um, wonderful individuals that are going to go out and really, you know, do good for the world and uh, the field of dentistry and, you know, highly, highly capable. I tell them once they finish hygiene school that nothing should be, you know, impossible for them, that they should pursue whatever, you know, other interests that they may, you know, have a desire to pursue in the future um, after they've survived two years of very intensive uh coursework in dental hygiene, um, but with with Texas, it's just really, um, you know, behind a lot of the states in, in the scope of practice for dental hygiene, so having, you know, uh, anything like that in the near future for Texas is probably, you know, not something that I'm, I'm expecting anytime soon. I think you know, the battle for local anesthesia is something that is, since I was in hygiene school 20 years ago has been kind of a, a talking point every time that, you know, comes up for um, passing. And, you know, the, the Texas uh, Dental Association just really is not interested in that, um, in that going through. And so uh, they tend to be a little bit more influential and powerful in the in the government uh, aspect. So I just don't don't see that happening anytime soon. And we're as hygienists, um, it's being requested that, you know, we are permitted to do that, get licensed to do that, but um, that the dentist, whomever you're working for, can opt, of course, whether or not they would like their hygienist to perform those duties. But, you know, I just, I'm not sure it's going to happen anytime soon. So then independent practice is just not even, I mean, if they're, if they're, I, I, if they're not going to let it give a shot, I, I can't believe they don't let them get the uh, anesthesia. I mean, you go into a hospital, a nurse is basically four years of college. I've always considered a registered nurse and a registered dental hygienist the same training. And there's not a physician in America that would, agree that their registered nurses shouldn't give the, the, the shots. I mean, I mean, 
You know, it's just, it doesn't make any, any sense to me. Um, so are there any other questions that you, uh, that I wasn't smart enough to ask that you wished I would have asked? I don't think so. I think we kind of uh, covered it head to toe. I just, you know, I my purpose in writing the the article for Dental Town and Hygiene Town was to, you know, just kind of encourage people to, you know, dentists, hygienists, assistants, to be familiar with with the rules and regulations, and to make sure that they were you know, doing everything that they were supposed to to take care of our patients because that's why those rules are there. And, you know, again, some of them you may or may not, you know, totally agree with, but that that's irrelevant. And um, again, to just have the fortitude and have the, uh, the thought process before getting involved in that kind of situation by, you know, I, I encourage our students to go out and never accept a position until you've at least observed or done a working interview. So you can kind of get a feel for what the, the hygienist is being asked to do. And then if any of those things would, you know, violate uh, what you've been taught and to make sure hopefully prior to getting into a situation that the office is doing what they need to do to follow uh, the rules and regulations and then if you are presented with that um, situation that you stand up for yourself the first time and just you know absolutely don't do anything to compromise your license and make sure you're familiar enough with those laws that you can that you can show those to whomever is asking you to not follow them and and be able to justify this is this is how I'm making my decision and I'm not going to do anything to compromise the patient care or my license. And also, do you, um, my, my last question is about uh, teledentistry. Do you see Blinn College hygiene program <clears throat> offering more courses online or do you see it staying at the classroom? Because we're now starting to see a lot of teledentistry companies kind of came out, especially in rural areas like Alaska where a hygienist might be, you know, 500 miles from town and so is online taking off in blend and do you see teledentistry around the corner for hygienists well we we have all face-to-face -face courses as far as students coming in taking courses at blend college um, we have a clinic here on site and so everything that the, that our students do at this point is face-to-face -face courses um, and having the clinical experience here on site. Um, as far as teledentistry is concerned, I think that's absolutely fantastic. And I do think it's kind of one of those things that, you know, is going to become more and more popular. And uh, thank goodness, because, you know, there are certain areas that are so underserved that if we can get, you know, some people out there that can use teledentistry to, you know, gain that access to care that that, you know, that there couldn't be anything, um, you know, negative to be said about that. And one last time, follow up on your said about, you know, do a working interview, work in the office. One of the things I see um, hygienists getting very upset is they'll work in a dental office and the doctor will say, well, if there's any pocket over a five, you have to put in some perio chip or something because there's an insurance code to bill it. And they're sitting there thinking, well, in my professional judgment, I don't think it needs a perio chip. And, and so what I would say to hygienists is the, the biggest red flag is that when a non-clinical person is telling you to do something like an office manager, it's like you don't you don't listen to an office manager about wet hand stuff. That's dry hand stuff. And when you go into a dental office and the office manager is telling you things like thirty percent of your patients should need or perio or forty percent. I mean that that would be like going. How would you like to go to a physician? He says, well, forty percent of my patients have to have type two diabetes. I, I mean, right. I mean that you. I mean statistics are, is a science designed to describe a population, it has no bearing on the individual sample size. I mean, statistics can tell me that there's there's more oranges than lemons, 
But if you're holding a piece of fruit in your hand, I, I can't use statistics to tell you what's in your hand. I mean, you either have diabetes or you don't. You either have perianal disease or you don't. And when you have, uh, and that's why I'm kind of getting old school where I really don't think you should own a dental office if you're not a dentist. Because I see some of these um, DSOs where they're completely owned by non-dentist and, and office managers are have to do their numbers and the numbers include this many perio chips and this percent perio. I mean, that, well, what do you agree or disagree? Well, absolutely. There's no place in healthcare, in my opinion, for that type of, you know, uh, needing to meet those particulars and have a certain percentage of your patients falling under. Just like um, some some practices uh, have, you know, incentives, and you work on commission and how many FMXs you take on your patients a certain day. Well, either they there's no there's no room for an incentive when it comes to providing care for patients. Either they need it or they don't need it, and I think. Having a financial gain on a hygienist for performing certain tasks is about as unethical as you can imagine. And I I caution students about that all the time. And I don't think it's I don't hear of many practices that do that, but I do know that that is the case and a lot of over treatment. Um, so I, I just think that you need to have good communication with your, your dentist. We need to have good communication with the, you know, front office that's, you know, scheduling these patients and maybe making these, you know, requests of the hygienist and just have, you know, good open discussions about, you know, your license and about what's in the best interest of the patient. And if those two don't line up, you know, I, I don't want students to go into a situation where they have some red flags in an office and they turn around and they, you know, don't accept a position when it could be something that they could go into that office and establish themselves as a respected member of the team and start kind of bringing about some of the, you know, uh, information and knowledge and and uh, kind of educating the people in the office and encouraging them to kind of rethink some of those things. So, you know, if you just turn around and you don't accept a position because there's, you know, one or two red flags, depending on the severity of those uh, situations, but, you know, if you see some things that aren't really appropriate with infection control or something like that, you know, accept that position if that's the only thing holding you back. and and bring that level of, of care up in that office and do it in a, a respectful way uh, that's helping not only the, the members of the dental team, but also the patients. Because a lot of times assistants and hygienists and even the dentists are doing things that could potentially harm themselves. And uh, they're doing these things out of, you know, just ignorance and, uh, if you can let them know that what they're doing could, you know, eventually harm themselves or their patients, I think that most people are receptive to that and want to do what's best for their own health as well as the patient. So I think it's just sometimes out of, um, I think a lot of times people that have been in practice, especially for a long time, get a little bit too comfortable with uh, bodily fluids and aren't as, you know, treat it as respectfully as they should and get a little bit too comfortable with that. And it, sometimes it takes some fresh eyes to come in and say, you know, you should not have an open Route 44 uh, sonic drink next to the ultrasonic tank that has no lid on it. You know, I, I think sometimes you just kind of forget to take things as seriously as they need to be taken. So... Hopefully, we'll get people that are doing the right thing out into these offices and really encourage everyone on the dental team to do what they should be to take good care of the patient. And you know, the the other thing when you're when you're young is when you go out there. I mean, I mean, the golden rule: 
it's not whoever has the most gold, the owner rules. The golden rule is simply treat other people the way you want to be treated. And I know everybody in the United States thinks that comes from the Bible. Shoot, it was in um, um, Hinduism 3,200 years uh, BC. One should always treat others as they themselves wish to be treated. Um, Confucius, 557 BC. What you do not want done to yourself, do not do unto others. So, I mean, every major religion has been telling you for 5,000 years, don't treat someone the way you don't want to be treated. And on that note, um, it was just an extreme honor that you came on the show today. Uh, Lori Rowland, RDH, MS. I hope, are you going to write us another article again someday? Because your last article was a huge hit. I hope so. I would like to do that. Okay, well, thanks for giving all the young kids um, some guidance as they're, uh, you know, most uh, podcasters are millennials, and you gave these young kids a lot to think on. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. You're more than welcome. Thank you. All right, have a great day, and if you ever stop in Beeville's, give my four grandkids a kiss from Grandpa Howie. I'll do it.